I'm Jan Ruschoff. I'm one of the freshman teachers here at Bryan Collegiate. On behalf of all the staff and faculty here at Bryan Collegiate, Welcome to the Collegiate family in our proud tradition. As you might imagine, we're quite proud of our school. Since opening in 2007, we have earned numerous recognitions and distinctions from the state of Texas and other people. Earlier this year, U.S. News & World Report recognized us as being one of the best high schools in America. Just 8% of all high schools are designated this way, and we've been on their list every year since 2012. In 2015, Newsweek magazine recognized us as being one of the top 100 high schools in the nation for what we do. However, perhaps what we're most proud of is this. In 2018, every one of our graduating seniors was accepted to a four-year university. Now, you are part of this proud collegiate tradition. Welcome. But what makes us so successful? Well, the first reason is you. We have the best parents in the district, and we know that you want the best for your kids. That you have enrolled your child at Bryan Collegiate is just one example of the sacrifices that you make for your kids. The second is our students. Listen, I'm a parent and I've had six teenagers, and I understand, yeah, they're still teenagers, but we absolutely love the students that come to us each year. They are the reason why my fellow teachers and I love teaching here. Now, speaking of my fellow teachers, I am so lucky to be teaching with some of the best and most caring teachers and administrators that you'll find anywhere. It is great to be around a group of professionals who are dedicated to finding new ways to be better educators and how we can be able to give our students the best opportunities to excel. But the biggest reason we are successful is because, quite frankly, we expect more of our students. If I was a freshman teacher at most other high schools, my students would not be taking a college class for four more years. Yet at Bryan Collegiate, freshmen are already enrolled in their first college classes. We set the bar at what is expected high, but we found that with our help, all students can rise to meet this new bar. Despite our successes, the sad thing is we do lose freshmen. During interview night, a common question that students ask us is essentially, can I do this? It is important to understand that no one leaves collegiate because they can't do it. Every incoming freshman has the ability to be successful. Listen, 40% of our students arrive having previously failed a grade or a star test, and yet they find themselves crossing the graduation stage and being accepted to a university four years later. Everybody can be successful here at collegiate. So, why do freshmen leave? Well, there are three main reasons. This includes when a family moves or there is a change to their family circumstances, which causes them to change to another high school. There's not much we can do about this. And while Collegiate has a lot to offer, we don't have a music or art program, nor do we have football or basketball team. And it's the missing of these types of activities that a comprehensive high school such as Bryan or Rudder can provide that is actually the largest reason why freshmen cite for their decision to leave Collegiate. Now, there are things we have done to make Collegiate more appealing to these students. These include our learning communities, our families program, which I'll talk about in a few moments, and an agreement to allow students to participate in some sports such as cross country at Bryan High, even though they are students here. Of the reasons why freshmen leave Collegiate, this next reason is the one that we're most concerned about. That reason is that students leave because they don't have a plan for academic success. Listen, Prying Collegiate isn't magic. If you are a struggling student in middle school, you will not automatically be an AB honor roll student just because you're enrolled here. If you do the same things you did in middle school, nothing is going to change. And this is why we are here tonight, to provide the tools necessary for academic success. Last year, several teachers realized that usually the first time that we find ourselves discussing with parents how to develop a plan for academic success is usually in October at our parent-teacher conferences. By this point, their student, we'll call her Sally, I've never taught a Sally, so we'll call her Sally to prevent the guilty. Sally, by October, is already failing. So we thought, instead of waiting until Sally is failing, what if we provide the tools for Sally's academic success before school even begins? That is the purpose for this presentation. We want everyone to understand what to expect for the next year, how your student can be successful, and perhaps most importantly, where you can turn for help. Now, this year is truly gonna be one unlike any other that your students had in their education. 
It's important to understand that high school, regardless of where you go to high school, is a bit different than what they had in elementary school or even in middle school. The biggest differences between middle school and high school is that in high school you have far more responsibilities. The coursework tends to be more complex, more is demanded of students in terms of studying and homework, and teachers don't hold their hands like that might have happened in elementary school or middle school. Moreover, for the first time in their schooling, what they do now in high school is going to be evaluated by university acceptance committees to decide who gets to go to college and who doesn't. So things such as GPAs, college interest essays, community service and tests such as the SAT and ACT become very important to academic opportunities after high school. At the same time that we levy so much responsibility on high schoolers, we must realize that they have more distractors. As they approach the age of 16, they start looking for that first car. And this often means that more students begin getting those part-time jobs. And of course, there are the biggest distractors that we see. And high school students start getting those first serious boyfriends and girlfriends. And then freshmen come to collegiate and realize that we are even more different than most other high schools. And there are many ways we are different. Now, some are rather simple. For example, at most other high schools, such as Bryan or Rudder, students would generally take seven subjects. And each day, they will attend all seven classes, Monday through Friday. But that's not what happens at Collegiate. First of all, we have eight instead of seven subjects. But the big difference is that instead of having every subject every day, Collegiate uses what we call a block schedule. This means that students will take four of these eight subjects in 90-minute classes on Mondays and Wednesdays, and that's what we call our A days. On B days, which are Tuesday and Thursdays, they will take the other four subjects. Then on Fridays, our C days, students will have 40-minute classes. The two classes they will not take on Fridays is kinesiology and PCC, and I'll describe what these classes are in a few minutes. Now, the reason we have a block schedule is that this is the type of schedule that Blinn College uses. College courses are given on Monday, Wednesdays, or Tuesday, Thursdays, usually. Our block schedule allows us to fit the Blinn classes into our school day along with our other high school classes. Another impact of aligning our schedule with Blinn College is that we also follow their calendar and not necessarily the Bryan ISD calendar when school begins. So there will be days that Collegiate has off while the rest of Bryan ISD will be in school and vice versa. Now this only affects maybe two or three days out of the year. But if you have any questions, the Collegiate website already has the upcoming school calendar posted. Another difference is we use semester grading instead of six weeks grading. So instead of starting over the grading period every six weeks, there is only one report card in Collegiate, and that is at the end of the semester, just like it is in college. You will have a progress report sent home every three weeks. In fact, your student will receive a grade in their PCC class for taking this report home and getting it signed by you every three weeks. Now also remember that you can also access your students' grades using the online resource called Home Access Center, or HACC. The last simple difference is truly simple, but it's something that confuses new students and new teachers here alike. At Bryan Collegiate, after the bell at 815 that signals that the school day begins, there are no more bells until the end of the school day. This means that teachers release the class, not the bell. Now why we do this? because you will never hear a bell in college either. It's about getting students into the college mindset. So these are simple differences. What are the big differences? Well, the biggest difference is what we see as our ultimate goal or objective. Now, don't be alarmed when I tell you that graduating high school is not the ultimate goal of what we do here. We know that graduation is important. Certainly, we know it must happen. But our ultimate goal lies beyond high school graduation. We see our ultimate objective is that after high school graduation, our students are prepared not only to be accepted to universities, but also being able to be successful in college and life in general. Remember, we ask more of our students. To prepare them to meet this goal, there are several things that are different about what we do in collegiate. Now, you're already familiar with the biggest difference, which is that we offer the opportunity for high school students to take college courses while they're in high school. This includes kinesiology. 
which are the first college classes that freshmen take. Now, I cannot emphasize too much the importance of these classes. Among the reasons we lose freshmen is that they fail kinesiology. To too many students, kinesiology seems just like a gym class. They'll be required to dress out and they'll be taking parts in wor uh, workouts and physical exercises, but they need to realize that kinesiology is actually a college level course in health and fitness. It is the same course that 18 and 19 year old high school graduates at Blinn are taking for college credit. Now there is a textbook they will need to read and assignments and quizzes they need to complete online. They must complete these assignments to pass kinesiology. And if they do not pass kinesiology, it becomes extremely difficult for the student to remain at collegiate. Another added course that your student will take is something called PCC, which stands for Path College and Career. Students will take a PCC class every year they're at collegiate. These classes help provide those skills necessary for students to apply and be successful in their college and their career. As freshmen, PCC 1 is designed to help students develop study skills, time management, and chart out their path to high school graduation. By the way, those three-week progress reports I talked about earlier, they are signed by you for a grade in this class. Now, the most recent big change is families. During Panther Camp, you might have had your student come home declaring they're a giraffe or an otter or an owl. And you asked them what they were talking about, and they said it was their family which might have still left you wondering what they were talking about. Well, at Collegiate, our students are divided into 21 separate groups, which we call families. These families are made up of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Then we group these families into seven houses made up of three families. This is all part of the social emotional learning program that we launched last year. Two years ago, our teachers realized that we do a great job of teaching ac academics, but many of our students struggle with the social emotional issues such as stress, conflict resolution, and relationships. Now this program is our strategy to arm our students with how to resolve these issues. We use a written curriculum that the district approved and purchase, and this also is a student-led program, but under the guidance of teachers. Not only has this allowed our upperclassmen to develop leadership skills, but it is a great opportunity for older students to mentor younger students. After all, you and I can talk to our kids about why they shouldn't procrastinate until we're blue in the face, and quite frankly, we probably already have, right? But it's amazing to hear a freshman student listen to a senior who is telling them the same thing and see that freshman is starting to actually listen and understand. Now, families meet during the school day on Fridays, but it's not uncommon that some families will voluntarily get together on the weekends to go to a movie or maybe go skating or some other activity. This is an example that families are working even more effectively than we imagined at building a community within our school where students feel they belong all while equipping them with the social and emotional skills to be successful. Something that is new this year is that four of our courses will be using a new pre-AP curriculum. Advanced placement or AP classes are high school classes that are taught at the college level. At the end of the school year, students can decide to take an AP exam. If they score well enough, they can receive college credit. In addition to our blend classes, your student will take a couple of AP classes such as AP World History and AP Physics beginning with their sophomore year, and students may also have the opportunity to take the Spanish AP exam. Now, soon after AP classes started some 30 years ago, schools began offering what they called pre-AP classes. The problem is that while the group that started AP classes, College Board, had defined a curriculum for what an AP class was, there was no such standard to determine what a pre-AP course actually is. So College Board has begun to standardize pre-AP classes across the country to make sure the classes have the correct rigor of coursework to prepare students for not only AP classes, but for college. Now this year is the first pilot year for this new curriculum and College Board is starting small. Across the entire nation, only 100 high schools are part of this pilot. And as the objective of this new curriculum is exactly what we do here at Collegiate, prepare students for college, Bryan Collegiate is one of these 100 schools. In June, the teachers of the four pre-AP courses, which is Algebra 1, Biology, English 1, and World Geography, we spent a week at a seminar learning about the new curriculum and how to use the different techniques in our instruction. Now, the goals of the curriculum involves more emphasis on being able to analyze and think instead of simply defining terms. We also realize that the rigor of the reading vocabulary may be challenging for some students. 
But what you need to know is it's going to be fine. While some students might be intimidated at the level of rigor the courses have, our teachers already know they need to scaffold all instruction. Now, scaffolding is just a cool teacher word that means that we know we need to support students as they learn. And when students have started the master one part, we can then remove those supports and then begin to challenge them with new information a new, at a new level. We know that you need to crawl before you walk and walk before you can run. Scaffolding for our pre-AP courses is no different. So that's what to expect at Bryan Collegiate. Now, what keys do students and parents need to know to be successful? The first topic I know is everyone's favorite, homework. Perhaps the first question that not only students but many parents might ask is why do we even have homework? Now this certainly was a question that an educational researcher named Alfie Cohn was asking when he wrote the book The Homework Myth in 2006. Cohn's book takes aim at why schools even assign homework. In fact, the subtitle of this book is Why Our Kids Get Too Much of a Bad Thing. Now, obviously, Cohn didn't like homework, and it wasn't that he was some quack. He was a PhD with a great reputation. And his book was reported across the country. Newspapers, TV, anything you think about, any type of different news outlets has stories that started to question the role of homework. Even some schools began to announce they were becoming homework-free zones. Now, these decisions prompted even more stories, which you might have seen on the TV or newspaper. This all reinforces the question, why do we use homework here at Collegiate? Well, quite frankly, because it works. The major issue that Cohen and others have with homework is that too much of it was busy work. The other finding was they found that too much homework, especially in elementary and even middle grade schools, is counterproductive. This is a reason that your student may have not have had very much homework to do until now. In fact, most of the research that Cohen looked at was the effects of homework at the elementary school level. When researchers began to look at the value of homework in high school and even in college, they found that homework is essential to academic success. Specifically, this is what researchers have found to be the benefits of homework in high school. You're going to hear me mention several times that learning is a process of repetition. The more times you hear something, the more likely you'll be able to remember that information. Now, homework allows for these additional repetitions of information to learn. It also develops study skills, allows our students to become more independent and manage their time. It also reinforces that learning isn't just an activity that is only found in the classroom. Now, there are four types of homework that we use at Bryan Collegiate. The first is preparation homework. These include assignments to read material or watch a video before coming to class. These pre-activities introduce this material to students, which we will design activities in class to work with this information in class, repeating exposures to the information. And certainly the second type of homework is all about this repetition process. Practice homework, such as math or science problems, are all about getting additional repetitions in the material after working with the skills or concepts in class. The third type of homework serves to get our students to use skills learned in class in different ways. This is called extension homework. Among the types of extension homework is our literacy initiative of requiring that students read a novel for each of their classes during the school year. These are just an example of the novels that your student might be reading this year. Not only does reading help improve reading skills and vocabulary knowledge of students, it allows them to have multiple examples of reading outside of normal school assignments. Now, in the last type of homework, we ask our students to demonstrate how they can take different skills and knowledge learned in class and integrate them into one project. Example of these are research projects, creative writing assignments, and a project that freshmen will pre uh, complete at the end of the school year called 20 Time. So, we understand the benefits and the types of homework to expect. Now, the big question is, how much homework should your student expect? Well, the prevailing guidance of organizations such as the NEA and the Department of Education give a rule of thumb of about 10 minutes of homework for every grade level. However, they note that homework might be more than when taking advanced classes such as pre-AP, AP, and dual credit courses. And oh, by the way, that's nearly all the courses we have here at Bryan Collegiate. But realistically, plan on about 90 minutes of homework per day. Now, this will vary from day to day. Some days you might have far less, but other days it might be a little bit more. Now, this might sound like a lot, but teachers at Collegiate work really hard to avoid assigning too much homework. First of all, we are careful to assign only meaningful homework. 
All homework must have a purpose that drives the learning process. We also use something called a vertical alignment chart. Remember when I talked about our crawl, walk, run approach? This is what this chart does. There is a vertical alignment chart for every grade, and each chart is divided into three columns that explains the expectations that students should have when they're August, when they should be in January, and where they should be at the end of the year. Essentially, we use this chart to make sure that we're not expecting students to run before they should be just crawling. Now, one of the advantages of being a small school is that every two to three weeks, all the freshman teachers are able to meet. We discuss about how things are going with our freshman class. Among the things we discuss is to make sure that we're not loading our students with too much homework. Now, I'll note that this works well to deconflict at the freshman level. However, if your student is taking a sophomore course such as chemistry or geometry, it is more difficult to deconflict across the different grade levels. Now, the last thing we do is to make sure that we are always providing enough time for complex assignments, such as research assignments. The problem we have is that despite giving more time, students still will wait until the last moment to start and complete these projects. This will result in having much more homework in those last weeks of our project than is intended. So now, what are the strategies that students and parents can apply to homework? Now, the first bit of advice is to develop a plan for homework. And perhaps the place to start the plan is to understand the importance of your student's planner. The purpose of the planner is to assist the student in keeping track of all the homework that is assigned, due dates, and all the other important dates such as exams. There are three things that students should bring to school every day. The first is their IDs. The second is their binder. It's even better when their homework is actually in the binder. The third is their planner. Planners are used every day for every class. Using their planners every class every day is the first best step to success. Now, the planner we use has two ca calendars. There is a weekly calendar and the monthly calendar. Their PCC teacher will go into more detail, but on the weekly calendar, students should record two things for every class for every day. The first is what we call the I can statement. This is the learning objective for that class and what they should be learning. This is always going to be posted in your student's classroom. The second thing they should be listed for every class every day is the homework that is assigned that day and the due date. What if the student doesn't have homework in a particular class? If Sally simply leaves the homework section blank in her planner, well, the problem is she might not remember if she didn't have homework or just forgot to write it down. This is why we want our students to write none, such as it is on this example under Spanish, if there is no homework. On the monthly calendar, this is where students write those major events down. For example, here we know that Sally has an English essay on the 14th and a World Geography exam on the 19th. Now, in addition to these major events, a technique we recommend is to know what homework is due for each day on this monthly planner. Here, we don't want the student to write the entire homework assignment, but if there's an English assignment that's due on the 11th, simply write the abbreviation for English so that Sally knows there's an English assignment that day. She can go back to her daily calendar to see the details of the assignment. Now, here we can see that Sally has assignments due on Monday the 10th for Algebra, Biology, World Geography, but she's already completed the biology assignment because she's now crossed that out. What we have found is being able to remember what assignments are due is half the battle. Using their planners each day is a great way for students to win that battle. But what if Sally arrives home, is ready to do her English assignments, but doesn't have the assignment handout she got in class? Fortunately, most teachers, and that's probably now pretty much all, use something called Google Classroom, which is an online resource which teachers use to post assignments and materials that are necessary to complete assignments. The student view on Google Classroom looks something like this. On this view, you can see the due date, the assignment instructions, and the resources that was necessary to complete the assignment. So if Sally doesn't have that handout, she should check her Google Classroom account and it's probably already available. By the way, Google Classroom is absolutely free and students provide the accounts through their Bryant ISD email accounts. Now, as a parent, if you want to know what assignments are being posted to Google Classroom, you, you can request to receive either a daily or a weekly summaries of what the teachers are posting to Google Classroom. Simply send us an email asking us to put you on and give us the email address that you want those summaries to go to and we'll sign you up. All right. So now that we have a way to know what homework has been assigned, now we need to establish a routine for doing this homework each day. 
Now, we highly encourage that parents have this discussion with their kids even before school begins. Find out what works for everybody. Now, here are some tips for planning this routine. Normally, it is best to have time that is set aside for homework be as soon after arriving home as possible. You might look at time that is available after school. School lets out right before 4 o'clock, but if your schedule means that students cannot be picked up until 5, then there's an hour right there where students can use for their homework. Now, whatever time is decided, we strongly recommend not doing homework right before bedtime. I'll explain this in a few minutes. Determining what time of day is to be set aside for homework is important, but our routine needs to also address when Sally does which homework. Remember, we have a block schedule, so Sally may only have world geography on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. So if I give her a homework assignment on Monday that isn't due until Wednesday, when should she decide to do that homework? Well, we strongly recommend that she does the homework on the day it was assigned, not the day it was before. If she waits till Tuesday night to do her homework, well, that was going to probably going to be the day that her younger brother breaks his arm and the family spends the night in the ER, and she's probably not going to get that homework done on Wednesday. By doing the homework the night it was assigned, on Monday in this case, she has a bit more flexibility to deal with these life's little surprises. Another reason to schedule homework is that if she realizes that she doesn't understand the assignment or she needs help, she can still get help from the teacher the next day in a tutorial and still have time to complete the assignment. One technique that we've seen students and parents use is a homework check sheet. This is completed each day by the student, and an example of it looks like this. This checklist starts with unpacking their backpack and also includes showing parents anything they need to sign or see, such as those great progress reports every three weeks, right? Then there's a place to plan the homework they're going to work on that night. It ends with checks to make sure that they have repacked their backpack with their completed assignments and have put their backpack in a place where they can just pick it up as they leave the next morning. Now, you can adjust this checklist to fit your needs, but I really like the unpacking and packing of material checks. Very often, we have students who may have completed their assignments, but they have forgotten to make sure it comes to school with them. So now we have a plan for knowing what we need to do for homework and when we're going to complete it. Next, we need to make sure that Sally has the right environment to do her homework. First of all, homework should be done in a place that is quiet so that your student can focus their attention on their work. Now, we understand that in today's modern families, this might be difficult to arrange at home. And I'll provide some ideas of where students can be able to find a place to study in a quiet environment in a few minutes. Oh, this might be a good time to talk about listening to music while doing schoolwork. Students love to listen to music when they do homework or quite frankly, do anything. So what students might be interested to hear about is something called the Mozart effect. Researchers have found that when people listen to music like Mozart, when they're doing homework or studying, they actually learn better. So this sounds like a reason why listening to music while doing homework is a great idea, right? Well, not really. Let's be honest, our kids are not listening to Mozart. Instead, they're listening to R&B, rap, country, hard rock, or any other form of modern music. So, research said, okay, they started looking at what was the effect of listening to these forms of music. Now, here's the deal. If you ask your student if listening to their music helps them with their homework, they're gonna say absolutely yes. And they're going to explain to you that listening to music makes it easier for them to complete their homework. And quite frankly, this is partly what the researchers found. The research shows that if a student has an assignment, say, to read 10 pages, they will finish that assignment faster when listening to music. Now, that sounds great, right? Well, not quite. In this instance, reading means that their student has seen all the words and has worked their way from page 1 to page 10. But when research is tested, the students or the comprehension of what they read when they were listening to music, it is undeniable to, that those who listen to modern music while reading comprehend far less than those who did not listen to music. In fact, music with words or lyrics greatly interferes with the learning of vocabulary or concepts. This is because the brain is trying to process not only the words that are being read, but also the words in the music. And if your student is one that tends to lip sync to the music, well, then the brain is even further distracted. 
So, if students are going to listen to music, have them choose calm or soothing music that ideally doesn't have lyrics. Otherwise, it's best to avoid music altogether. The other environmental factors we want to establish is good lighting. Have paper, pencils, highlighters, or any other resources necessary to complete the homework available and remove distractions. And what are the top distractions? Well, by far, they are phones and games. There are some times that students might be using their phones to do homework, especially if this is the only resource they have for the internet. But if a phone is not necessary for homework, then we recommend putting the phone in another room while the student is doing homework. Likewise, the Xbox or PlayStation be can become way too much of a temp temptation. If this is an issue, find a place where your student can do their homework that isn't in the same room as these distractors. So we have most of our homework plan in place. So what should the role of the parent be? Once again, here's what research and successful students tell us. Our most successful students are those whose parents see their role as being a supporter of the student instead of just being the homework enforcer. We totally understand the parents may be checking to make sure their kids are completing their homework. In fact, to a degree, we want that. But we want to shift the paradigm to understand that the goal of homework is not just to complete it. Rather, successful parents help reinforce the why behind the homework. Remember, I shared with you the reasons why we assign homework in the first place. Help reinforce with your student the purpose behind the homework and that it isn't just this teacher's attempt to torture them. Now, we talked about establishing the right environment for homework. Helping establish the environment is a major way you can help your student. One thing we do not expect parents to do is to do their students' homework. Don't take me wrong. I wouldn't care if none of my parents know the relationship between deserts and the rain shadow effect. I do, however, care that my students understand. Moreover, if it's been 30 years since you took high school algebra or you may not have even ever taken biology, that's okay. We do not expect you to help, help your student with her homework by helping them solve problems or answer questions. Help them develop a homework routine, establish the right environment, and reinforce it with them the reason for their homework. Now, while we don't expect you to help them with their homework, what is also effective is when you ask your students about their homework and what they're learning. Say, if your student has a textbook reading assignment, ask them to briefly explain what they've learned. Even if you have no idea what they're talking about, you will have a good gauge of whether they are understanding the material. If they do, great. If not, then suggest they relook re what they have done or encourage students to come in for tutorials where we can help them. Every teacher at Collegiate is required to have at least one hour and 45 minutes of tutorials each week. Most of us actually are available for tutorials much more than that. This is a great opportunity for students to come in and ask about things they do not understand, get assistance with homework, or many times simply have a quiet place to do some homework after school. What many students don't realize is that tutorials are not just for the struggling students. I've had students who never made less than an A on any of the exams they took for me, but they still frequently came to my tutorials. In fact, I would suggest that a reason they were A students was because they did come to tutorials. But if your student is struggling, please let us know. We hate to hear students who have gone the entire semester struggling at home and we never knew that they needed help. Let us know as soon as you think your student might be beginning to struggle. We can and we will help. Now, the good news is there are many resources available to help students. I've already discussed tutorials. Now, here are some additional resources, especially if a student needs a quiet place or needs access to an internet. The first place, quite frankly, is right here at Bryan Collegiate. As you come into 100 Hall, that's the one where the office is at. The large room on the left, the windows looking into the hallway, is what we call our Go Center. Not only are there computers and internet available, there are also printers that students can use to print out assignments. The Go Center is open every morning at 745, it's open during lunch, and is open after school until 430 each school day. Now, most Saturdays, a teacher from Collegiate comes in between 8 o'clock in the morning and noon to open up the Go Center during what we call Saturday School. This gives students four hours to work on homework or study on Saturdays in a good environment with internet and computers to use. And because the teacher is always on duty, Saturday School is often used to administer makeup tests or retests so that students don't have to miss time during school doing these things. 
Now, one of the great advantages that collegiate students have is when they realize they're not only enrolled at Bryan Collegiate High School, but they're also enrolled as students at Blinn College. Their Blinn College ID gives them the right to use the Blinn College Learning Center. Again, here's a quiet space to do homework, which also has 80 computers available with internet. And what's great about the Learning Center are their hours. On weekdays, it is open till 9.30 in the evening. And while it's not open on Saturdays, it is also open on Sundays between 5.30 and 9.30 in the evening. Now, beyond the resources of the Ghost Center and the Blinn College Learning Center, several students use the resources at the Bryan and College Station Public Libraries. Now, normally they're open at about seven o'clock in the evening on weekdays, and they're also open on Saturdays, Sundays. They too have quiet places to work and computers with internet available. Now, because the homework is important, Bryan Collegiate has a homework completion program called ICU. Just like in the hospital, ICU stands for Intensive Care Unit, and this is how it works. Let's say Sally has an assignment that is due for my class on Monday, but she hasn't done it or she hasn't done it really to standard. I don't simply give her a zero in the grade book and she gets to not do the assignment. Instead, I assign her to attend ICU during the next day's lunch and learn community periods. And during this time, she is supervised by teachers and has the time to work on completing any of the homework assignments that she has not completed. She'll still eat lunch, but it'll be in the ICU room instead of in the cafeteria. Now, ICU is not meant to be punishment. Rather, it is a safety net that we use to make sure that every student has the learning benefit of the homework that is assigned. Nor do we want you to build an expectation that the student is slacking if they get in an occasional ICU. We realize that life gets in the way sometimes. Rather, if your student does receive an ICU, it just might be good to, for the two of you to relook at that homework plan and see if there might need to be some tweaks made to it. What we don't want the ICU to become, however, is a substitute for doing homework at home. Remember, one of the most common types of homework that we assign are preparatory assignments. These are designed to provide a baseline of information that will reinforce in the classroom. If students are regularly not doing these assignments, it reduces the effectiveness of the entire learning strategy. Now, we generally are concerned if a student has less than maybe a dozen ICUs during the semester. Although we love students to have just a couple ICU assignments, if at all. We begin to get really concerned when we see students getting much higher numbers of ICU assignments. The reason is that we can look through the number of ICUs a student receives throughout the semester and compare that number with the student's grades and we see a clear relationship. Students with high number of ICUs generally are the ones that are struggling overall in their academics. All right, so I've described ICU, but what if at the end of ICU on Thursday, Sally still has an outstanding assignments that are not completed? Well, she will then be assigned to CCU or our critical care unit. When students are released on Friday afternoon, Sally doesn't go home. Instead, she goes to CCU where she is given the time to complete any of the outstanding assignments that she still needs to complete. She is only allowed to leave under one of three conditions. The first is that she completes her homework, although she must stay for the first full hour. The second reason is that, that the teacher that's run CCU decides to end CCU that evening. And then the third is that the parent or guardian comes in and signs Sally out of ICU. Now, Sally's older brother or sister isn't allowed to do this. Her neighbor isn't allowed to do this. It must be one of her parents or guardians. Of course, if there is an emergency, we understand and we'll make the right provisions. Now, ideally, your student's CCU should be very few as you now have all the information you need to develop a successful homework plan. So, what about studying? I know, many of you are thinking right now that didn't we just spend the last 15, 20 minutes on this? No, because homework is not the same study. Homework is important, but homework are those activities that a teacher assigns and generally will be checking for completion. So I'm talking about cramming, right? Well, no, cramming is a really bad idea in which students try to basically relearn everything they uh, have learned that unit right before a test. Studying, however, is the independent continuous process of reviewing material learned throughout the unit, if not the semester. Remember I said the learning process is a process of repetition. Well, studying is about getting as many repetitions of the material as possible. 
The environment for studying is the same as homework. We want a quiet place, we want good lighting, and free of distractions. There are three general types of studying that we're going to be describing. The first of these is studying notes. At Bryan Collegiate, we require our students to take notes using a method called Cornell Notes. And these notes have the students divide their notepaker into two parts. A left side which take up, up a, picks up about a third of the paper and the remaining two thirds of the note paper on the right side. Now it's on this right side of the paper where students take notes as they would with any other note taking system. After taking their notes on the right side, what we want our students to do is identify any of the new vocabulary words and write those words on the left side of the notes across from where the definition of the term is in the right side of the notes. We also want students to read over their notes and think of what are the questions the teacher might ask on a test over each portion of notes. Again, they should write that question on the left side across where the question is answered by the notes on the right side. Now comes the study. We do not want our students to study the notes by simply reading their notes. This is a passive strategy that is not nearly as effective as we would want. Instead, to study our notes, we will want the student to take another piece of paper and cover up the right side of the notes, only revealing our questions of vocabulary words on the left side. Now, to study the notes, they just go down this left side of these words in question. They start to quiz themselves. Do they know the definition of geography? What, can they answer what are the five themes of geography? And so on. And if they know the definition or they can answer the question, they move down to the next word or next question. And if they don't remember the definition, then they simply remove the covering paper and check themselves against their notes, after which they recover their notes and continue down the left side of their notes. Instead of simply reading their notes, this is an active strategy that forces students to engage with the material. Oh, by the way, it is also a much quicker and effective way of studying. Now, essentially, we are creating flashcards out of our notes without having to create flashcards. Now, here's an idea that we challenge all of our freshmen to do this year. First of all, we challenge our students to review all their notes during a unit every other day. By the time they get to their unit exam, there won't be any need to cram as they've been studying throughout the unit. Now, each class has a final at the end of the semester that tests all the material taught over the semester. So the second part of the challenge is to take 10 minutes per week and review all the notes that a student has taken in the semester. Now this seems like a lot until you remember that we're not having them read over all their notes. Instead, what we want them doing is going over the left side of your notes, the vocabulary and the questions you already have learned throughout the semester. Why study this way? Well, it comes back to the fundamental concept that learning is a process of repetition. What repetition does is begin to move information in our brain from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. In other words, it creates knowledge. Now, in addition to notes, many teachers will create online resources such as Quizlet and Kahoot. These are essentially quiz games to help review material. Not only are they a different way to study, students should compare their notes to these resources to make sure their notes are complete. Now, if a teacher doesn't make a Kahoot, students can still make their own online resources. These are free online resources and they're actually not very difficult to create yourself. Now, the last study strategy we'll discuss is the use of study groups. These can be very effective, especially in preparation for what they will be doing taking courses over at Blend Campus as juniors. A benefit that study groups provide is that many times students, quite frankly, learn best from other students. Of course, the drawback is that studying in groups with other students create the potential for more distractions. But the if the group can be disciplined, it can be a very effective way of studying. Now, as great as our homework and studying plan might be, if students are not getting enough sleep, school becomes much more difficult. This is a picture of Sally. Okay. Not really, but unfortunately, I see this student probably three or four times a day. And the issue here is very simple. There simply is not a lot of learning going on here. But the effects of not getting enough sleep isn't just that it makes it difficult for students to stay awake. It impacts learning in many different ways. While many students simply give up the fight and lay their heads down, even those students who are fighting to stay awake find it difficult to pay attention because they're concentrating so much on trying to stay awake. But even those students who are sleep deprived but do not feel drowsy are affected. Now research has shown that being sleep deprived, and that's defined as normally not receiving the recommended number of hours each night, 
Well, those students have a decreased capacity to remember and to learn. Now, unfortunately, we see a correlation between insufficient sleep and behavior problems in the classroom. And let's be honest, being tired makes all of us crabby. This sets the conditions for crabby students, which too often can lead to behavior problems. So how much sleep is enough? Health and education research tells us that teenagers generally need about nine to nine and a half hours of sleep per night. Now, despite the fact that students seem to sleep nearly 12 hours a day during the summer, they rarely get that much sleep during the school year. The average high schooler gets less than seven hours per, sleep, per night, and that's actually much closer to about six and a half hours. In fact, less than 85% of high schoolers get more than eight and a half hours of sleep, and eight and a half hours of sleep is still actually not what is recommended. So how do we get our teenagers to sleep more at home? Well, first of all, sleeping should be a regular routine where the time that teenagers go to sleep and the time they wake up is the same time throughout the week, even during the weekends. The best sleep needs an environment that is dark and quiet. Phones, computers, and electronic games should be turned off if not removed from where the student is trying to go to sleep. The buzz from a phone when someone sends a new text message seems to be a force that no teenager seems capable of resisting and sometimes late into the night. Now, also avoid caffeine a few hours before going to sleep. And we should remember that caffeine is not only found in coffee, but many snacks have caffeine as well. However, snacks that are high in carbohydrates, such as these here, are great to snack on right, for, right before bed as they actually help teenagers go to sleep. And now at this point, I'll remind you that when you are making your homework plan, don't schedule your homework time right before bedtime. We want our students to be able to go to bed relaxed and ready to go to sleep. And that does not happen if they go to sleep while trying to figure out problem number eight on Mr. Ruiz's algebra homework. All right, so we have our homework plan. We've been studying. We've been getting plenty of sleep. Now what happens when we have that exam that doesn't go our way? Listen, even with the best of preparation, students can still fail a test for a variety of reasons. With good preparation, it should happen much less, but it still can happen. If and when that happens, we need students to retake all of the tests they fail. Our grading policy allows for students to retake any exam in a high school course in which they do not earn at least a 70%. There is a procedure which includes a mandatory tutorial to do the test corrections, and we will have parents sign what we call a retest prescription. The retest prescription is used to make sure that the parent knows that the student has failed the test and is retesting. The student then takes a test and gets the higher score of either the test or the retest up to a maximum of 70%. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for students to retest. It is a great opportunity to ensure students pass their classes. I have had students who, as freshmen in my class, never pass one of my tests the first time, but they retested every test they failed. Those students are today part of class of 2019 and will be graduating from Bryan Collegiate this upcoming May. Now here's the bottom line. Make sure that your student retests every test they do not pass. All right, so we're almost to the end of this presentation. We're finally on my favorite topic, phones in the classroom. Now, if you ask any high school teacher, they will tell you that the number one behavior problem they face is students on their phones. Students with their phones are a huge distraction that we fight on a daily basis. When a student is texting or Snapchatting or whatever they might be doing on their phone, it's important to understand that it not only interferes with that student's ability to pay attention, but what we too often see is everyone around them is also distracted as they're trying to figure out what that student is doing as opposed to what's going on in the classroom. Now, the district has what is known as your, a BYOD, or Bring Your Own Device Policy. It provides the opportunity for students to use their own phone or device in the classroom as long as the teacher approves it. Moreover, the district policy is clear that during instructional periods, that's class time, the phones can only be allowed for academic reasons. Now listen, we love to see our students read. However, reading Instagram is not what we have in mind. The same policy, that comes from the district also gives teachers with the authority to enforce this policy through the confiscation of the phone if the student re refuses to comply with the policy. 
Now, once confiscated, the phone will go to our Dean of Students, Dr. Caperton, and it will only be released back to the parent at the end of the following school day after paying a $15 fee. Now, as you can imagine, no one is very happy when we confiscate a phone. However, you need to realize that this is a last resort option. Throughout a school year, I might only confiscate four or five phones from all my classes. I will guarantee you that if your student's phone is confiscated, it will be because the phone has become a problem that has been discussed with the student on many different occasions. So, how can you help as a parent? Well, first of all, Discuss this policy with your student and make sure they understand what the expectations are. And speaking of expectations, we would ask you also, please do not place an expectation on your student that they need to answer or automatically immediately respond to any call or text you might send them. We often will ask a student to put their phone away and be told that Mr. Ruschoff is my mom and she'll be mad if I don't respond right away. Listen, we understand that sometimes you need to know if your child is staying after school for an activity or for tutorials, or you might need to let them know that someone else will be packing up from school. We understand that. However, we ask that you understand that our number one priority is the education of your child. And part of that is eliminating any distractions that take away from that purpose. So if you do text your student, let them know that you do not expect them to answer until the passing period between classes or at lunch when they're actually allowed to be on their phones. Oh, by the way, if there is an emergency, we recommend calling the school office and we will pr promise to get the word right away to the student. All right, the last thing we want to talk about is the importance of communication. When we talk about tr the tradition of Bryan Collegiate, it is a tradition in which the teacher, parent, and student are all on the same team working for the same goal, which is preparing students for the success after high school. As teachers, we work hard to keep parents informed. We try hard not only to let you know when your student is struggling, but also let you know when they're excelling in class. But we really want the path of communication to be both ways. Please feel free to contact teachers about any questions or concerns about your child in school. We want to know how we can best help. The best way to contact any of your students' teachers is through email. You can contact us through the staff page at the Brian Collegiate website. Our, also, our email addresses are on the course syllabus that your student will receive from us the first two days of school. If you want a parent-teacher conference, just let us know. Tell us what is the best time for you, and we'll rearrange our schedule to fit your busy schedules. All right. So once again, I want to welcome you all to Brian Collegiate. It is our sincere hope that we have provided you with the tools necessary to allow this to be the best school year yet. Thank you.